Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the RSV webinar. I am Ann Biakan from the BC Lung Foundation. I am the Vice President of Health Initiatives and Programs. And before I introduce our guest speaker, let me inform you that this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be posted on our website after. Please also note that your please mute your microphones. And if you have any feedback or questions, please type them on the Q&A box or the chat box. And now let me introduce Dr. Kaplan, who is our guest speaker for today. He is a practicing family physician and the medical director of LHIN, Pulmonary Rehabilitation Clinics in Ontario, Canada. He chairs the Family Physicians Airway Group of Canada and is also an honorary professor of primary care for respiratory medicine of the Observational and Pragmatic Research Institute in Singapore. Dr. Kaplan is also a clinical lecturer at the University of Toronto in the Department of Family and Community Medicine. While being a member of the Physicians Advisory Panel of the Medical, of the medical Post, the Medical Advisory Committee of the Pulmonary Hypertension Association of Canada and a member of Section of Allergy and Respiratory Therapeutics, Health Canada. He also had other 136 peer-reviewed articles and 104 conference abstracts, and it could be many, many more. Um, Dr. Kaplan? Thanks, Men, and uh, thank you, Kelly, also for the invitation, and uh, thank you for allowing me to join you in BC virtually. So as, as uh, Men said, I'm a primary care doc with an interest in respiratory medicine and vaccinations, so and we're going to talk a little bit about RSV, and we're going to touch on COPD as well, and hopefully with all that, we're going to come together with and have a little fun. So here's my uh, disclosure. I work with just about anybody that makes anything inhaled and uh, as well as vaccines. And uh, as GSK makes the only current RSV vaccine in Canada. So I'll, I'll thank them for their sponsorship. So the, what we're going to talk about here today is we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the burden of disease of RSV, outcomes of RSV in the older population, especially respiratory patients. Uh, we're going to talk about vaccine and vaccine technologies. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about COPD, and I'm going to go over the most recent uh, CTS guidelines, and especially the area when we talk about exacerbation prevention. So I thought we'd start with the patient. So Seema is a 65-year-old woman with a history of COPD. She had uh, did have an exacerbation in the last year. Um, however, as with many patients with COPD, we may not know all their exacerbations, especially if they're mild ones. So an important thing is to find out actually how many chest colds someone had in a year and did they get seen at a walk-in clinic? Did they get seen and given prednisone or antibiotics for them? Her diagnosis is confirmed with spirometry. Uh, she has a hypertension osteoarthritis. Most people are multimorbid. And she comes in with for a checkup in October. And while she's there, she happens to have an acute respiratory tract infection. Uh, so that's not unusual. And, and that's uh, what happens to us in clinic. We get complications of our regular visit. So she's currently on a long-acting muscarinic attack as a form of Spreva, as well as, as well as using subutamol or Ventolin for her, for her therapy. So exacerbations, as you know, is a big deal. And you know, it's uh, we'll talk more about this a little bit later, but we have a stable situation. And of course, if you're higher risk of exacerbation, you have exacerbation, it causes persistent airway inflammation as well as a slow recovery and in fact, loss of lung function. So that's really what we want to do. So exacerbations are a very big deal in COPD patients because they are the number one cause of death in patients with more severe disease, but they also lead to poor quality of life, uh, poor loss of lung function, uh, comorbidities and cardiovascular risk, which I'll touch on, uh, and, and mood issues and even cognitive issues and cognitive fa failing that occurs because of exacerbation. So all that is really good reasons why we'd want to actually try to prevent exacerbations. We also know that exacerbations are, are associated with increased mortality. So this uh, very old art article from Dr. Sola Katoyuna um, years ago talked about the likelihood of survival on the y-axis versus time on the x-axis. And you can see people with no exacerbations live longer than people with three or more exacerbations, which is A to C, as you can see there. The other thing is after exacerbation, each, each exacerbation carries an acute short-term mortality risk. And the more exacerbations you have, of course, the higher the risk of that happening. And the other thing you can see happening here is the exacerbations start coming closer and closer together as we continue to age otherwise. So exacerbations lead to exacerbations and lead to mortality. So clearly the strongest predictor of a future exacerbation is a risk of having exacerbations. And obviously by preventing exacerbations, we can, that is a really important goal to decrease that risk. So 
why is it here that, oops, sorry. So in, in terms of, of that, what are the reasons why patients uh, who are a little older and have COPD have higher risk? And they, they, they do because, as you know, they, um, they tend to have long hospitalizations. So someone who's got COPD ends up in the hospital tends to have a fairly long, a long hospitalization. They also lose lung function. They're more likely to be hy hypoxemic and uh, their airway inflammation is worse. So with all that, that leads to some pretty bad outcomes. So um, as we age, um, you know, we have, we have a number of factors that occur. It may be that our immune system is, is uh, affected just even by the disease or the therapy or just by age. We call that immunosenescence. Having multiple medical conditions, the environment, such as living in congregate ho homes, and just age itself affects immune status. So we have to worry about the congregate homes. We have to worry about the chronic medical conditions, including lung disease, but also cardiovascular disease, renal disease, diabetes, and so on. And as you know, COPD is a very multimorbid illness and often have both these issues. The immune system may just be related to age, but of course, many of our patients have issues for, for their immune system based on uh, chemotherapy, biologic therapy for multiple things. Although I should mention that asthma biologics do not infer a weakened immune system otherwise, but being HIV, transplants, and so on. And just age is the big one. Well, the question, of course, is this, this lady, Sema, who's got this acute illness, so what's the matter with her? So we can do an acute swab for, for influenza, if we think it's influenza. We can do a rapid test for COVID. But what about testing for RSV, which is we're going to aim on that a little bit more. And it'd be really nice if we actually had rapid testing currently available like we do for COVID. Uh, they do exist elsewhere in the world. They're not in Europe, especially. They're not really available here, even in North America, even in the States right now. There currently are tests that are combined rapid tests for influenza as well as COVID. And there's some private companies that do that. And probably by next year, we're going to have a, a, a triple test available rapid testing to us uh, in, in, our, in uh, people to buy themselves. The best test is a PCR test, but as you know, it's really hard to get that. Um, we've sort of overdone our PCRs appropriately for COVID, and now it's kind of hard to get PCR testing done outside of things like the hospital setting. So really, that's the best test for this right now. But because we can't access this readily in practice, uh, most of our patients with RSV are not firmly diagnosed. So she's got this infection. She's had her flu and pneumococcal vaccinations. So we're thinking she's less likely to have influenza, although influenza is hardly 100% vaccination, a pneumococcal vaccine as well, very, very protective. So we're thinking RSV. And this is a pretty important condition for all these reasons and uh, that we've talked about. And she's had a couple of exacerbations in the previous year. So she's at risk of having bad outcomes because she's a recurrent exacerbator and she's got RSV. Well, let's talk about what RSV can do. Now, when we talk about RSV, many of us consider it as being a pediatric illness. And as you can see, in terms of hospitalizations on the left, most of the hospitalizations do occur in those children under the age of five years old. A uh, smaller number occur over the age of 65. So that seems like it's not as big of a deal for older adults. But if you flip that around to mortality, you can see that fortunately in the young children, very few of them die, which is fantastic. There's only one in a thousand die. But of those 22% that get hospitalized with RSV over the age of 65, one in nine of those patients die. So 85% of the mortality of RSV occurs in people over the age of 65. So common illness, big deal in, big deal in infants. And yes, you know, RSV, RSV bronchiolitis does increase the risk of developing asthma afterwards. Lots of reasons to be concerned about it in children. However, in adults is where the morbidity and mortality gets really extreme. And I'll talk more about that. If you're looking at for COPD exacerbations, and you can see certainly viruses are the, are the number one cause of acute COPD exacerbations. And probably one in nine hospitalizations for COPD or RSV and one in 10 overall exacerbations are related to RSV. So that doesn't mean it's not other viruses as well. It can be rhinovirus, it can be influenza, as you can see. But RSV is a big player when it comes to hospitalization and uh, exacerbations. And you can sort of see here as well that having multiple morbidity increases your risk of bad outcomes. So this is the rate of hospitalizations. You can see that the far left is about a comorbidity. So asthma does increase it, but not as much as diabetes, coronary disease, heart failure a little worse, and COPD really has that highest risk. So our COPD patients are particularly at risk. But when we're talking about RSV overall, remember the over the age of 60 is really the risk that happens as well, and any comorbidities adds on to that risk. 
So what is age? What's the issue with age doing this? So we understand that as we get older, unfortunately, many things decline as we get older, but the concept of immunity declining, the concept of immunosenescence is there. And that's why uh, over the age 65, we get different flu shots for patients over the age 65, either being the, the flu ad, the adjuvant of flu, or the flu zone, the high dose flu, which what we use in Ontario mostly to get that extra adjuvant or the extra antigen to get a better vaccine response. So immunosenescence is just the fact that as we get older, our immune system is a little less responsive. In addition, another concept people are a little less familiar with is the concept of inflammation. So as we get older, as we get older, we tend to have more inflammation from the same illness. So that's an issue. In addition, as we get older, things get less elastic. So our, our tissues are less elastic. We're less able to empty our lungs. We have poor mucociliary clearance and epithelium becomes a little bit more denuded. So therefore more likely to get invading invasion of infection and so on. And as we can imagine, you're more likely to have multiple comorbidities. As you continue to age, you're going to probably age with more, with multiple comorbidities, all of which decrease your, your risk of, of having good outcomes if you get a bad infection. So looking at some Canadian data of hospitalized patients, about 30% were diagnosed with influenza, and RSV was the next most common virus after influenza. But as I mentioned to you, most times it's actually not checked for. So it's only more recently that we start doing viral swabs routinely with COVID that we're now actually finding RSV. So back in 2011, 2015, they probably significantly underestimated the number of people actually had RSV. But if you, if you pick up those ones that had RSV, 18% were in the ICU, 24% required ventilation, a non-invasive ventilation, 9% required mechanical ventilation, and the mortality was not insignificant. So RSV is more likely to cause hospitalization, ICU admission, and so on. So it is an important illness for those people who have impaired lungs like COPD. The other side to this coin is even if the lungs are doing okay, that Im immune response, that inflammation that occurs, then leads to cardiovascular outcomes. So it's well known from other viruses as well as bacterial pneumonia, macaulical pneumonia, but having this infection releases cytokines. And you've learned this also with COVID, that cytokine storm that occurred with COVID led to people to have cardiorespiratory collapse. So a little less so than, than COVID, but again, the same kind of situation where you get these kind of cytokine releases and you get cardiovascular complications like acute MIs, arrhythmias, and heart failure in a fairly significant number. As many, almost 30% of the time it can happen to these patients. So it's not unusual for patients to go into hospital without a cardiovascular issue and come out of the hospital with it. And unfortunately, that then leads to poor survival rates after hospitalization. So we have an issue not only with the lungs, but it causes these secondary cardiovascular complications that can be quite fatal, in fact. Now, we all know this about influenza. So let's compare influenza to RSV. So that lower respiratory complications, the cardiac complications, the hospital readmissions are significant influenza. You do know that one of the most common causes of admission to influenza is that bacterial superinfection, that bacterial pneumonia that can happen in up to 20% of patients. So if you compare that to RSV, the numbers are very, very similar. So we understand that influenza vaccination is important for all these reasons. It's lung protective, it's cardioprotective, it's protective for MIs, um, but so is RSV vaccination. So that's really what we're going to come and talk about. So I want you to think about RSV as being as, as important of a problem and maybe even more important than influenza is, just something we haven't been talking about for a long time. The other thing is the, the residual morbidity that occurs. So if you look at the high-risk group, you know, the people who have pneumonia, arrhythmias, cough, there's a fair number of people at six months still have persistent, persistent symptoms. And that's the high-risk people. What about the low-risk? I mean, the numbers are smaller, but there's still a very good number of people that are still suffering months and months and months after having RSV. And I can tell you personally that I had RSV uh, uh, last winter. And um, I was coughing and, and wheezing for, for months afterwards. So it can be, a, a matter of fact, I had COVID uh, just before that, and I actually suffered less from the COVID than I did from the RSV. So just recognize that this is a persistent problem. It's such a big problem. If you look at hospitalizations, unfortunately, I wasn't hospitalized, but look at hospitalizations. Uh, one in three patients, when they get out of the hospital, have a poor functional status than when they went in. But almost 10% were no longer able to live independently. So that's a pretty big deal. If you can't live independently anymore, then your whole life has changed, the family structure has changed, quality of life has changed. So important thing to think about. This looks at people um, over the age of 60, hospital RSV, and a third of them, again, decreased functional status six months after hospitalization, and 14% required a higher level of, of care dis a discharge. So we're going to talk about vaccine and vaccine strategy and the difficulty to get multiple vaccines. But when your patients sort of say to you, 
that I don't want a vaccine. I don't want to pay for another vaccine. I don't want to get vaccinated. You, you, I show them a picture like this. Here's what you're going to look like, what you're looking like now and feeling right now. And this is what you're going to look like after a hospitalization. And that's that disability. And I would say that some people actually fear disability more than they fear death. Uh, they, they don't want to become dependent. They want to be able to be independent for as long as they can be. So as I said, you know, the attributable cases to, to, vac to RSV um, really are, are not as much as the confirmed cases because we actually don't test for it routinely, and I've mentioned that already. So what happens, this is a very infectious bug. You get exposed to it, incubation period is four and a half days. You get some symptoms, and you're contagious for up to eight days. But if you're older, that, that can be another three days. So it can be up to 11 days you're contagious. And if you're immunocompromised, and you therefore cannot clear the virus, then you can be infectious for up to three months. So you can see how fast it can spread through the households. And I can tell you personally, that's what happened to us. My grandchild got it at daycare and he was actually just fine with it. He got better quickly. His mother got very sick, gave it to my wife, who then gave it to me. And we all had a bit of a bad cough and mucus and phlegm, which I'll talk about for a long time. The other factor with RSV, and we've learned all this, of course, about COVID a little bit, is we're very frustrated. You get a, you get a virus, so you get a vaccination, but yet it doesn't last long enough. And as with COVID, you only get six months of immunity with the vaccine, especially now with the vac with with the uh, variant changing. With RSV, the issue really here again is you only get short term immunity. It'll probably last the season, but it won't last into next year, and therefore it can lead you at risk to having um, infections again through the life. And of course, the more immunocompromised you are, the shorter that immunity is actually going to be for you. So again, we're going to think about vaccinations and when you should get them, but recognize that it, you know an infection may give you the season, but not the next year. So it doesn't give you prolonged immunity, even in the healthy. Now, RSV is a seasonal disease. It's got two genotypes, an A and a B. They co-circulate. Every year it can be a little bit different, uh, but the reality is it really is usually from November all the way till about April. That's usually the situation. It's just with much worse in the actual winter and very, very little cases in the fall and the summer. However, COVID seems to have changed our seasonality, and we're actually getting it a little earlier and lasting a little longer. And lots of theories about this. Has it got to do with patient interaction and masking and social distancing? Has it got to do with uh, the children exposure to it? Does it even have something to do with climate change? Because we've actually learned that climate change actually changes a little bit about the pro uh, the, the progression of, of respiratory infections and all kinds of infections. So these are all factors that may be there, but we are learning that it may start a bit earlier than it used to in the past in terms of RSV season. So how does this infection work? So what happens here, as you can see, is the RSV virus invades that the ciliate epithelium, the respiratory epithelium, that you know, cilia on it to clear mucus, as you know, and it causes that epithelium to be destroyed and denuded and 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 be and be sloughed off into the into the lumen. So you got you got epithelial cells, you got the virus, you got nuclei, you got mucus, all causing great big slugs, and that leads to a risk also because that epithelium has been denuded of bacterial superinvasion. So the most common bacteria that sits around, of course, is pneumococcus. You know, pneumococcal pneumonia is the most common thing. It could also be H flu and MCAT and so on in those low-risk people. But you can see that bacteria is just waiting to superinfect and cause a secondary infection. However, that large multinucleated cell full of, full of cells and mucus and nuclei, we call that a syncytium. If that's the name for this virus, we're calling it respiratory syncytial virus. And those big plugs of stuff are very, very hard to, hard to cough up. And that was actually a big problem for me. In fact, bronchodilators actually did not make me better. The only thing that made me better was actually an aerobica. And some of you are familiar with the aerobica device from Trudell, which is a po oscillating positive expiratory pressure device that you just breathe in and it sends in a wave to get in behind the mucus and help you cough it up. So if you're ever stuck with people with bad mucus production, the aerobica, A-E-R-O-B-I-K-A, uh, is a lovely device. Uh, the older ones were called acapella and flute, by the way, but this is the newer one that I tend to use. Now, in the large airway, that big accumulation of mucus and DNA can be cause mucus plugs, like I talked about. That's lucky because you can eventually cough that up, hopefully. But if you're unlucky, all that plugs gets into the small area, and that obstructs and collapses the alveoli, preventing oxygen transfer across the A gradient, and therefore you actually get hypoxemia respiratory failure. So that's the picture here, what happens with this virus, as well as a bacterial superinfection. So how do you tell between RSV and COVID and, and flu? Um, I mean, RSV is going to be a symptomatic condition for uh, virtually always. It can be sort of just milder stuff like the fibromyalgia, less commonly. The big thing is going to be the cough and the wheeze and the sputum. That's going to be the thing that differentiates. I mean, you can get 
You get high fevers and aches and pains and sudden onset with influenza. COVID can be a little of any of these things, but usually the mucus is not so heavy and the bronchospasm is not so bad. So you got a lot of, you know, a viral illness with a lot of new onset of fever and cough and wheeze and sputum, you're thinking RSV. Now, the epithelial damage does more than just clog up the airways. And we've learned a lot from the uh, from the severe asthma world. And as you're familiar with, the epithelium, the epithelium releases cytokines upon damage. And those, those include T TSLP and IL-33. And of course, we now have a biologic against TSLP, as you, as you know. The concept here is that epithelial damage leads to the activation of cytokines, which then leads to activation of type 2 mediators like IL-5 and IL-13. So now it's looking somewhat, hey, wait a minute, that looks like the severe asthma picture where we talk about IL-5 and 13 and 4 and so on. And that cytokine release from the epithelium may be, in my mind, part of the reason why the bronchospasm is such a big deal in bronchiolitis. That's my theory. I don't have any evidence of that, but I think that's probably real. So how do you treat SEMA for her acute viral illness? Well, if it's, you know, depending on your belief of antivirals, but certainly we have antivirals for influenza, Tamiflu, we have antivirals for COVID in terms of Paxlovid, but we do not have an antiviral for RSV. Many things have been tried for it. Nothing really works very well. So all we really have is supportive care. So if we have an acute infection and we don't have a treatment for it, I think prevention is going to be pretty important. And obviously, it's supportive care you're all familiar with, whether it's going to be oxygen and bronchodilators and lavage, and, you know, and bronchi bronchial lavage and even intubation and so on. So how do we reduce SEMA's risk of exacerbations overall? I mean, that's the big picture here. So before I get into vaccinations, you know, obviously the things that are really important, so smoke minimization if she's still smoking, avoidance of secondhand smoke if that's a factor, pharmacotherapy, which I'll touch on at the end for her COPD, appropriate hand hygiene, masks, and so on, vaccinations. Now, of course, not just the RSV we're going to talk about, but influenza, and pneumonia, Adacel, COVID. And I do want to actually mention shingles as well, though it's not going to make a difference to her lungs. Patients with COPD have a higher risk of having uh, shingles. More importantly, have a higher risk of post neuralgia. Adacel is the tetanus with pertussis. So it's not something to think about with your older COPD patients, but if they have grandchildren, to get pertussis, that's going to be a big deal. So all these vaccines are going to be important. So we now have a vaccine that actually helps prevent RSV in older adults. And that's what we're going to talk about here. So we talked about the immune issue in the older adults and the fact that their immune, immune system is not quite as strong. So what we need to make a good vaccine is something that's going to be a good antigen and something that's going to improve the immunogenicity in that aging immune system. So how do we do that? So the right antigenic target. Well, many years ago, some of you may be familiar with the fact that in the 60s, there was a vaccine created for, ch for young, young children uh, for bronchiolitis. And it was for the post-fusion form here. I'll talk about what that means in a minute. Unfortunately, not only did that not help um, the, the, um, the RSV infections, it actually worsened them and actually led to some mortality. So that was an example of a vaccine that actually made the situation worse. What we've done, what they've done here now, all the different vaccine companies are aiming at the pre-fusion form. And you can see there's a lot more little colored circles, which are called epitopes, which are sites of activity for the antibody to actually work at. So the better, the, the darker the colors you can see based on this picture, the more um, value it has as a potential place for an antibody creation. So on, so the, the one that was done in the 60s was post-fusion. These are the ones we're going to talk about now are all on the pre-fusion form. And these now um, have had good success because they're actually creating an antibody to, to help prevent the illness. So there's three vaccines currently um, either available or in the works, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, in Canada, the only one that's available is called the RexV, which is the RSV pre-fusion vaccine from GSK. And I'll talk to you a little bit about that because it's what we have in Canada. Pfizer has one as well. It's a pre-fusion, but it does not have an adjuvant. Uh, it's available in the United States. I'll also mention that the Pfizer vaccine is also being used in pregnant women to therefore vaccinate the baby upon delivery. So they've got antibodies against the RSV in the baby. And Moderna is working on a messenger RNA vaccine, and uh, hopefully they're going to be able to combine it with influenza as well. So we actually can only have to give one shot. So these are all coming, but right now in Canada, we only have the RxV. And the concept here is the antigen is the right one, the prefusion state. And the adjuvant. Now, the adjuvant is a good, strong adjuvant called ASO01E, which is the same adjuvant that gets used in shingles. For those of you that have had a shingle shot, you know the adjuvant is very strong. We get a lot of reactions from that. Up to 10% of people can actually have quite a significant reaction, lose the next day. 
Um, however, they get better the day after. The dose of the adjuvant is half the dose that's in shingles in the RSV vaccine, but therefore it's going to be a very good immune stimulant on top of the proper antigen. So the big study here, the pivotal study was done by Alberto Poppi, who's a respirologist from Italy, who I know well. And what he, what, they, what the group did here with, with uh, you know, 25,000 patients is they randomized one-to-one -one the Orexv prefusion RSV vaccine, adjuvant vaccine against placebo in year one. And in year two, they took the people who were vaccinated and they either gave them another dose or gave them placebo. And that was to actually see whether or not you needed a vaccine in the second year for efficacy. And then they followed them for, for year three. So right now we have data up until the end of the second year. The third year will be May, 2024, and I'll come back to that. So the study looked at, at looking at acute respiratory infection, low respiratory tract disease, and severe low respiratory tract disease. And it probably makes sense. If you just have a few symptoms, it's, it's there. If it moves down to your lower chest, you know, then it's lower respiratory. And if you needed, uh, you needed some kind of corrective treatment, uh, positive ventilation and so on, it was going to be more severe lower respiratory tract disease. So just like in COVID, you know, we don't vaccinate just to prevent COVID, although that would be nice. We, we vaccinate to prevent severe outcomes from COVID. And similarly with RSV, we want to prevent people from getting very sick with RSV uh, with the vaccine. So here's the outcome. The major out primary outcome was the lower respiratory tract disease, which had an 82.6% reduction. That's great. But actually what really impresses me is the severe lower respiratory tract disease. That's the one that's going to get people hospitalized in the ICU and high risk of acute mortality and their reduction was 94%. So it seems to be a pretty efficacious uh, vaccine. And if you look at comorbidities and things like that, you can see that the numbers are still 92 to 100%. If you look at those people who are frail, uh, especially, the, so this is the pre-frail, so they were not yet under, under, undergoing a lot of uh, treatments. Um, they also had very good, uh, very good coverage. And even the age 70 to 79, so is this anybody over the age of 60 in this trial, 70 to 79 still had very, very good outcomes at 94% reduction. Uh, there wasn't enough patients over the age of 80 in this trial to actually give a good analysis of that. So you can see that in these higher risk people, the efficacy was perhaps even better. Uh, now, I, I said there's both an A and a B uh, sort of serotype, or, and, and they both are around from year to year. Um, and while this is this is against RSV A in terms of the vaccine, it actually works against both A and B quite well. So that's really not going to be a barrier. So that's not an issue. So it works for both serotypes of the illness. So that's year one. What about year two? So in year two, you can see that um, the efficacy is still 74, 77% in terms of that. So that's really a, a, a very significant response. If we look at influenza vaccines, which we all take religiously, the numbers can be anywhere from 30% on a not a great year for matching, you know, up to about 65% on a really good year. So this still outperforms our influenza, which we sort of recognize we do regularly. So the reality is that this boost, that this is probably a two-year vaccine as of right now. And you're going to say, what about three years? What about four years? And it's interesting because shingles with that same adjuvant, even in immunocompromised people, is known to last at least five years. So it may last longer than this as well. We don't know that yet. And we'll know again in May 2024 when they read out the third year of data. So, uh, so to see this space soon, I can tell you next year. But right now, it's being considered for most people as a two-year vaccine. My only small concern about this, people are immunocompromised. You know, will it be good for two, year, for two years for them? But as I mentioned with the shingles vaccine, it does last two years. So probably it will. Uh, well tolerated. You know, it has the, the regular side effects, you know, mostly local side effects. Okay, so side effects are an important way of dealing with it. As you're counseling people about their side effects, I warn everyone they're going to get a sore arm, they're going to get a fever, they're going to feel bad for a day. And they, they should expect that. Okay, and if it happens, let's say congratulations, that means you've had a good immune response. You're supposed to feel bad. It's, it's, it's pushing up your immune system. It's trying to improve it. It's trying to activate it. So these things are normal. We do not see really severe side effects. We do not see mortality from this. Matter of fact, if you look at the fatal severe adverse effects on the right there, you can see that there was less of them in the treated group than in the placebo group. So that means that it's not the vaccine, it's the illnesses underlying. So our vaccine recommendations matter. So all of us that say we should do this, that we should actually making, making a plea to get people to vaccine, not just for RSV, but for everything. But we'll highlight RSV and come back to all the vaccines at the end as well. But we have to we have to say, hey, uh, we want to prevent you from getting sick, and we can do that, and it may cost a little bit of money. We'll touch on that, but you know this is important for you to prevent bad things from happening. Now, NACI has NACI, the National Advisory Committee of Immunization, and Canada hasn't 
yet discussed how the recommendations could be. But I can tell you that ASAP, the American um, College of Immune Practice, they've said that everybody over the age of 60 may receive a, a single dose of RSV vaccine using shared clinical decision-making, which means you discuss it with your patient, you talk about the pros and cons and decide if you want it. Okay, so that's everybody over the age of 60. But if you actually have underlying conditions, lung, heart, uh, immune, diabetes, uh, it's, you see the list there. And of course, if you're frail or you're older, you're living in a nursing home, all these people will increase the risk of having bad RSV outcomes on top of age. So age itself is a risk factor, but then you add other things to that list and you can see how it's almost an exponential increase in the risk of bad things happening. So back to SEMA and she has the COPD with exacerbations and she's on Spreva currently. So I want to move on to her COPD management. So we've talked here about the fact that she should have uh, RSV vaccination and she's got other vaccines as well, which I'm going back to. But what about this overall COPD? What about pharmacotherapy? Well, you all have seen this spy, downward spiral of health that happens to people with COPD. You know, that as they get more short of breath, they get less active, they get less active, they get more deconditioned, they get more deconditioned, they get more exacerbations, and it sort of goes down and down and down. So people very quickly lose their abilities to do regular, ordinary things that we take for granted, you know, and you watch this 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 happen. And this happens more exponentially, of course, when people have, have exacerbations. So not only severe patients have exacerbations. This is an Eclipse study, which goes back to 2010. And they followed people for three years in this and looked at what happened for people if they had exacerbations in the first year, second year, third year. And they looked at the severity. You can see that obviously people with more severe disease had more exacerbations and had more recurrent exacerbations. But even people with moderate disease, gold stage two, that means an FV1 of 50 to 50 to 80 percent, even they had exacerbations, you know, with you know, as many as almost a quarter having more than two exacerbations in a year to year. So it still happens in all patients. And in fact, those exacerbations, you know, may lead to different outcomes. So with mild with milder disease. That may lead to bad cardiovascular outcomes. With more severe disease, it may lead to bad respiratory outcomes. So either way, we have to pay attention. All our CPD patients have some risk. Now, most recently, the, um, the CTS uh, recommendations came out. This is the sort of overview overall of management. So, so on the bottom left, you start with make a diagnosis of spirometry, you know, and then hopefully we can we can impact on this. So we're not talking about end of life care in the bottom. You can look at more. You can look at exacerbation risk. You can look at CAT score for for health status, shortness of breath based MMRC, lung function to give you an idea where you are. First step is going to be education, smoking cessation, vaccinations, and inhaled bronchodilators. Moving up to uh, longer acting bronchodilators, pulmonary rehab. If people are persistently short of breath. Uh, I'll talk about other pharmacotherapies in a little bit. Oxygen and uh, surgical therapy, things like lung volume reduction surgery, which is gaining, which is gaining notoriety for people with upper lobe large bullae. So here is the pharmacotherapy algorithm, and it has been changed a little bit from previous. So I want to start here. These are people with milder disease. They're not horrifically short of breath. They're functioning well. It's an earlier diagnosis. It used to be we'd say start with just a short acting agent, but we know that COPD is a progressive condition. Uh, we also know that people tend to change their behavior because of the illness. So if we start with a long-acting bronchodilator, we can hopefully keep people active, and exercise is known to actually prevent the progression. So starting with a long-acting bronchodilator is important for that group. And you could choose LAMA or LABA. I think most would choose the LAMA or long antimuscarinic antagonist in Canada. If your symptoms get worse but you're not an exacerbator, uh, then we want to move early and directly to a dual bronchodilator. So if you make the diagnosis here, that fee one's less than 80%, and they're having symptoms, then you should move to a dual bronchodilator right away. If they have a lot of exacerbations, then we're going to move to triple therapy. I'll show you some of the data on that. And I said there's some other therapies we use for frequent exacerbators. So we sometimes we use PD-4 inhibitors. That's that's called reflumilast or Daxis. It's very good for people with chronic bronchitis. Mucolytics, we don't have great mucolytics in Canada, unfortunately. Macrolides, zithromycin, 250 grams three times a week, has been shown to also decrease exacerbations in that group by about a quarter. So we have good treatments to decrease exacerbations. Um, very careful using macrolides because of the risk of QT prolongation and, uh, and, and antibiotic resistance. And unfortunately, Daxis can cause things like diarrhea and weight loss. So you got to be cautious with those drugs. So triple therapy is where we're going to go most of the time. So the two big trials with triple therapy from two big companies and uh, the the impact study compared triple therapy, uh, ICS Lab Lama versus ICS Lava and Lab Lama. Uh, and they compared, they did that for a year and had a week follow-up. So this is using fluticasone furate, you have to do it in Volantarol. 
And what they saw here is a reduction with the triple therapy versus both of the duals of exacerbations and even mortality. So we see here the triple therapy versus the duals decreases exacerbations and mortality. If I move on to ethos, very similar. They just had two arms of the ICS dose here, which we'll just we'll remove because they only use we only have one dose for that in Canada. And similar situation in terms of exacerbations, triple outperformed either of the duals and mortality, the same picture, triple outperformed both of the duals. So we have triple therapy outperforms the dual therapy in people who have exacerbations. So a frequent exacerbators considered two or more per year or a single hospitalization. Again, so remember that group. I didn't say all COPD patients. I said those patients who have who have an exacerbator phenotype should be on triple therapy. Otherwise, they should probably be on dual labo lama to control their symptoms aggressively. Now, it's more than just that, though, because we know that people who have COPD as well as concomitant cardiovascular illness are at extra high risk of dying. Right? So if you look at coronary disease, if you look at conditions that we treat to prevent mortality with heart disease, and we compare that to the effect of the impact and ethos trials, it's interesting. So the, so the, the big study that started us treating with statins in coronary artery disease was the, the 4S trial. This was a huge trial. It changed everyone's practice significantly. And in a five-year trial, mortality reduction was 1.8%. In the heart outcomes prevention study, the HOPE trial, where they used, used ramipril versus placebo, a five-year trial, again, a 1.8% reduction in mortality over five years. But if you compare those amounts to impact and ethos, right, you're seeing that the one-year reduction was 0.83% for impact of 1% uh, for ethos. So yeah, um, one year, that kind of reduction in mortality uh, is pretty significant and pretty impressive compared to five-year things. And these are all things we do routinely. You would never not treat someone with a statin or an ACE inhibitor with cardiovascular disease, uh, but yet people don't get triple therapy when they should. So is SEMA optimally managed? So here's our story. Um, again, she's come in. Now, she was actually stepped up to dual therapy about six months ago from the Spreva to a noro umeclidinium volantarol. She's still using her subutamol PRN. So is she on significant therapy? Remember, she's had a couple of exacerbations, plus some other ones that once you ask her questions, she actually found that she had. So which dual therapy? So, you know, we, we can currently a lot of patients are going to be on an ICS lab plus a LAMA. For example, Advir plus Spreva or Brio plus Spreva or Simbacort plus um, Umeclidinium or you know, you know, all the different combinations you can think of. But with, we, we, we've, we know now that it's much superior to use a therapy that has everything in it together than, it has, than if they're two separate devices. Single inhaler therapy is better than multiple. And I'll show you a little study on that. Uh, is it once daily versus twice daily? We, we have drugs that are once daily, which is going to be the the, the elliptic device and twice a daily, which is going to be the MDI that's in uh, that's in breast tree versus versus trilogy. Uh, sometimes dry powders are not the right thing versus MDI. You know, in terms of a peak inspiratory flow, if someone has a very low peak inspiratory flow, then it's possible. Not everybody will have this problem. It's possible they may not be able to activate a dry powder pro properly. Overall, can they use the device altogether? Can they get the medication down to their lungs? You know, and there's different components there. And of course, you know, we all are familiar with the fact that MDI in the environment uh, is a factor in terms of greenhouse gases. I don't think that controllers are the big problem. I think that subutamol MDIs are the big problem. However, it's still going to be a small factor. Now, you all know the device technique is very important. And you've all seen slides like this where, you know, if you use, misuse your inhaler, and this is what you guys do all day long, you have a higher risk of a hospitalization, eMERGE visit, steroid use, antimicrobial use, you know, and you can just see the difference in in you know, having no errors for having a critical error, much higher risk of having bad things happening. A critical error is an example of you don't activate it, you don't take the top off or something like that. So this is sort of the work that shows that single versus multiple. You can see that if you switch from a multiple inhaler to a single therapy in the bottom left there, in a real world setting, you decrease exacerbations. It actually improved lung function in, in the same trial in the, in the upper right. If you look at risk of um, uh, healthcare status, you can see that uh, triple therapy and a, a single therapy outperform multiple. And in terms of cardiovascular issues, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, the idea of actually having a cardiac outcome, triple therapy with a single inhaler therapy had a much lower risk of having that than in dual therapy. You know, and it makes sense, you know, adherence is going to be an issue. If you're using two different devices, there may be inhaler technique issues as well. So we try to put it all in one device and we have a couple of choices for that now. 
Now, if you compare eumeclidinium of elanterol versus other lava llamas, you know, and, you know, we could talk about all these sort of differences in there are one better than the other. So, I mean, I mean, quite frankly, uh, indicatorol is the best llama, but eumeclidinium has the best lung function result. Spreva probably has the best, uh, teotropin probably has the best exacerbation reduction versus all the other llamas. Uh, so they're all somewhat similar, but you can sort of make arguments uh, that combina certain combinations might be better. Uh, and I, I don't make a big deal out of this, uh, but you know, we have some pretty good data for, for eumeclidinium and Valantrol, which of course are both also once a day, uh, as well as indicatorol, like peronium is as well. Now, this other concept in health steroids. So this paper from Bradley Yates talked about uh, the airway potency versus the side effects on the bottom. And so we're talking about steroid safety. So if you look here, we're going to compare the, the, the systemic activity versus the area protection. So on this far left, they're going to be good protection and low systemic activity. As you move across, we're getting we're getting a higher systemic activity, with therefore more potential for for abnormal for for bad outcomes like like uh, like osteoporosis and sugar diabetes effects and so on. So what you're seeing here is that fluticasone propionate, that's the old adver, you know, was somewhat similar to bedesonide in terms of the numbers, in terms of activity. But fluticasone furate is actually a different animal. And it actually has a better safety margin and it rapidly progresses to high airway activity with a better safety activity. So there's no question in my mind that furate is a much better steroid than propionate. So if you're using Advir, I would suggest you move over to, to, to Brio uh, because anyhow, it's once a day versus twice a day and a lifted device is fine compared to a discus. So something to consider to moving on to Brio. There's other steroids as well that are not included in this evaluation in terms of things like cyclesonide, uh, you know, which probably has somewhat of a safer uh, analysis, but doesn't is not available in combinations and is not currently indicated for COPD. So again, this is just something that helps you, the, you know, the risk of pneumonia and so on, maybe a little bit higher as well. So there may be some advantages in the different bronchodilators. There may be some advantages in the different steroids. But to me, the most important thing is going to be able to use that device is going to be the most important step there. The other thing is, please, please, please do not delay in the people that need to be on triple therapy to move them to triple therapy. And I'll see patients who come back to see me in the office after exacerbation who are still on the medication they're on when they went in, like they're on a lava lama when they went into the hospital, and nobody switched them to triple. Unfortunately, I also see people that come back to see me and they're on ventolin four plus four times a day and atrophin four plus four times a day, as well as the antibiotic and the steroid because nobody ever switched them to something. So if you any, any of those situations, it is our job to rapidly and aggressively get them onto triple. And if they say, well, how come the doctor hospital didn't? You say, well, you know, be, uh, or, you know, or, or saying you as an educator, you say, it's really important you go back to see your doctor to get onto this triple therapy because we know that it reduces the therapy, it reduces the risk of having further exacerbations. And the numbers are pretty significant. You can see the blue line and the red line are pretty far apart here. And that's the difference in people who had a delay of 30 days to get switched to triple versus staying on what they were before. So pretty significant. So in one month, uh, those risks are very, very high of having even hospitalizations uh, and, and so on as well, and even severe hospitalizations coming back in the hospital. So if they ask you why, you say, because, well, the hospital doctor was looking after you in the hospital. And now this is about our job to prevent you from getting another one. So do not delay, please. The other factor I want you to think about is that COPD is a cardiovascular disease. So here's an article that looked at the review of the NHANES data. And they said, well, people who had COPD had a higher prevalence of having cardiovascular disease compared to uh, case match patients without COPD. So that means that COPD and cardiovascular disease are very related. And that makes sense on lots of levels. But we have to start thinking about COPD as a cardiovascular illness. And in fact, if you go back to Framingham data, and you look at the FBC as a risk factor, the lower the FBC, the higher risk of cardiovascular risk. So it's been long associated with uh, COPD being a cardiovascular illness. So to summarize, because I don't want to take too much time of your day, um, RSV is a seasonal virus that affects people of all ages. Uh, the very, very young you know, is, is a big group as well, but we're talking more about the very old. RSV will exacerbate asthma, COPD, as well as heart failure. And even otherwise healthy adults over the age of 60 can have a significant prolonged morbidity after an RSV infection. Complications are similar to influenza. So we know influenza prevention is important. Risk of severe disease increases based on age, immunity, and other chronic comorbidities. We have vaccines that are going to help other things. We now have a vaccine to help prevent RSV, and you are allowed to co-administer with other vaccines. Gold just released the update for gold. And as you can see here on the, on the second last line here, 
they've recommended that the RSV vaccine for individuals over 60 and or with chronic heart or lung disease. And it says and or, it doesn't say 60 and, it says or. So you can make a decision for people over the age of 60 in your own mind if they should be vaccinated because they're high risk of bad outcomes. So it's something else to think about. But they also mentioned all the other vaccines we've talked about. COVID vaccine. And I hope all of you have been protected with the new XBB vaccine uh, because the new variants are really a different animal than the old ones. You're not protected from the old vaccinations. So COVID, uh, the, the pneumococcal vaccines, as you know, we now have Trevenar 20, uh, which in a single vaccine gives you as much as the 15 and the 23 and outperforms the 13, which is what we had up till now, the, the conjugate vaccine. And those extra seven serotypes are the ones that actually cause a lot of illness and resistant organisms. Okay, we talked about RSV and of course the Adacel, as I mentioned as well, it was the Zoster vaccine, the Shingers, which we talked about. So I think it's time to call the shots. And I'm just going to remind you that the shots, there's lots of them, you know, and we want to make sure all this stuff gets given. We want to make sure that our patients with highest risk get protected because once you get ill, you can't go backwards and you really want to make sure that that's not happening. So there's my email address there, 44kids at gmail.com. You're also all invited to become members of the Family Physician Members Group of Canada. We've opened this up to all primary care practitioners. We have all kinds of tools there, resources, newsletters and stuff that are there. So please just go to the website and, 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 and uh, send, send a message that you want to join and we'll send our, our resources out to you. And my email is there, 44kids at gmail.com. You have to remember why, I guess how many children I have. Okay, so I'll stop sharing now. And uh, we can sort of look at some of these questions and so on. Did you want to go through those men with, or do you want me yeah, to? Yeah, sure. Them? Yes. And before that, we'd like to thank you very much for your very, very informative talk. And I'm pretty sure it got, uh, it, uh, uh, we have a lot of questions on the Q&A box. One of the most common question is the costs. Okay, so this is not covered under the government pharma care or um, medical insurance. So people are paying out of pocket. And I believe one of the uh, participants said she asked her pharmacy and it will cost her $290 out of pocket. One participant from Toronto said that she just got it and it costs around $280. It's about $230 to the pharmacist here in Canada. That's a bargain in the States. It's $285 for the pharmacy. That's American dollars. So that's like $4,000 here, as you all know. I'm kidding, but okay. So yeah, it is, it's not inexpensive and the markup can be up. I've seen it as high as $300 from the pharmacy here. So um, yeah, that's an issue. It is being covered in Ontario for for people over the age of 65 who live in congregate homes. People live in congregate settings altogether. So the, the government has recognized the need for it somewhat equivalent to influenza, but you're right, it's expensive. Uh, but what price independence? What price mortality? But I don't mean to be flippant because some people just can't afford it. And that is an issue. Uh, so we, I mean, it's, it's it's a good point and we just have to recognize them. We still live in a capitalist com com country and, you know, someone's developed this and they have to get paid for it at some point. But it is expensive and that is a barrier. Okay. So another question is, some of our participants here are, are double lung transplant patients. Is RSV really, really necessary for them? Or RSV vaccination is important to them? And is that affect the reduction in mortality in, in terms of compared to COPT? Yeah, so the study by PAPI actually did not include immunocompromised patients. So this is, this is an evidence-free zone right now. But Michael Melgar, who reviewed all this for the CDC, made the statement. It was a very powerful statement for the United States where they only deal with evidence usually. But he said, uh, and this is him saying it, not me, but I agree with him 100%, was that people who are immune compromised are the highest risk and therefore will likely get the biggest benefit from it. So I think immunocompromised is, as I say, the highest risk. And uh, I, I congratulate you on your transplant and being successful with that. And, if, um, and I think you need to protect yourself as best possible. Now, there is a small but and the but is the, the transplant rejection medications you're taking may somewhat reduce the efficacy of the vaccine. So that's a problem. So it's always best to get your vaccines all done before getting your transplant, if possible. And that's what I try to do, or before starting on a biologic, if any of you are on biologics and so on as well, uh, then it'd be good to get that. But, but barring that, then you want to try to get your vaccines get, given when you can. 
And you have to recognize that the efficacy may not be quite as effective. Now, I'll give you another just um, personal thought, and I have no evidence for this, but I saw a couple of articles of this, is that if you've normally, when you get a vaccine in your arm, you hold it still and don't move it because you don't want your arm to hurt, right? Because you don't want the muscles to hurt. But actually, there's a little bit of evidence that actually, if you do a lot of work with that arm, you get better blood flow to the arm. So I'm recommending people not actually actually use that arm. You're going to be a little more sore, but you're more likely to have a bit of a reaction, more likely to have a good response from the vaccine. So uh, yes, it may be money that, that isn't spent well if the vaccine doesn't take very well, but I think you're better off to, to, to try to protect what you can protect with all the vaccines we just talked about, uh, rather than just, just you know, look on luck. You know, and if you've got a grandchild, you're getting exposed to RSV because all children get exposed to RSV before the age of two in Canada, uh, especially after the COVID year. Has finished mm -hmm. now. Everybody's got it. They're all going to have it. The difference is how sick they get, you know. But unfortunately, if you get it as somebody you know, compromised, you're more likely to have a worse outcome. So my answer would be absolutely get it to protect yourself and all the vaccines okay. I talked about. So that's a good point. Are there any any different adverse effects that you could uh, you could expect for those people with pulmonary fibrosis compared to those people from COPD? Yeah. Good question. I mean. Fortunately, pulmonary fibrosis is not directly associated with any immunocompromising conditions, so they actually should get a, a good response from this, other than just age and illness, which affects everybody's immune system a little bit. Uh, but no no different side effects in terms of, of having pulmonary fibrosis. And should the population with pulmonary fibrosis get this? Well, you know, pulmonary fibrosis, acute exacerbations, as you know, are multifactorial, but infection is still usually a big cause of it. So I think anything you can do to prevent infections and prevent viral infections is a good thing for, for, the, for our pulmonary fibrosis, interstitial lung disease population, absolutely. There are a good exchange of email uh, of uh, stories here in the chat box, but okay. One of the question is that, um, do you think that the pharma providers will be able to assure availability or provide some a little bit of support for patients to acquire, uh, to get the RSV vaccine? So maybe a discounted price later, or it will be covered by extended healthcare sooner. So uh, in terms of coverage, there are some drug plans that are covering it right now, but not all of them. That's going to change over time. And that's just basically that, you know, all, all, all of us as, as patients and customers of the insurance company have to ask for it and push that. Is a, is a pharmacy going to eat the cost part of the RSV cost for you? Uh, there's, I think, zero chance of that. I, I think there's a negative number chance of that. So I'm sorry to say. But coverage is something that's probably going to happen in the future. Will the government start to cover it? I mean, that's a really good question to say right now. We recognize that the that the value compared to influenza is about equal, right? So why would we not? Sorry, I got sun in my eyes. It's making me very bright here. Sorry, but the um, why would we not aim to have equal coverage and equal prevention with RSV as we do with influenza? That entirely makes makes good sense to me. And while I'm asking that, I was just I saw another question about someone who's under the age of 60 and can they get RSV vaccine? Is only over age of 60? Have that conversation with your clinician. Uh, because I think it's a good idea, and I give it to people under the age of 60. If they have cardio, cardio or respiratory risk that's significant, I don't want them to even get one RSV infection. All right. Thank so you. can we take, can we have the RSV vaccine at the same time as the COVID vaccine? Absolutely. You can co-administer RSV with everything. There's a couple of buts there. But number one is, at least in Ontario, they recommended to separate the new COVID vaccine from the RSV by at least two weeks. I think they did that just because they're being safe in terms of new vaccines to make sure there's no funny interactions. Um, but I think that's not an issue. And, and the older COVID vaccines uh, done during the study was not an issue. So so I, I think they're all fine together. The one I wouldn't give together, I wouldn't give shingles together with RSV because they're both adjuvants. It may be a good thing. You may get a really good immune response, but it may be a bad thing because your side effects might be significant. So uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm not brave enough to do that to people unless they, really, unless they want me to. Uh, but I, I tell them it's probably a good idea to hold off those two together, but everything else can be mixed. Is there any data? Okay. Is there any data describing when may be the best time to receive the RSV vaccine when a patient like Alan Lowe is taking immunomodulation drugs such as methotrexate? Hi, Alan. How are you? Um, sorry to hear you're on that stuff. Um, so, so preferably when you're not taking it, this is the right answer. 
Uh, preferably, if you can hold that, depends on, so something, a more severe biologic, you know, like a, a rituximab or something like that, which works on the T cells, the recommendation for vaccination is actually to hold it for three months if you can, or start it at least a couple weeks prior, or have the vaccine a couple weeks before you start the vaccine, before you start the biologic. Methotrexate isn't quite as strong, and you probably could hold methotrexate for a month or so and get away with that. Something to discuss with your clinician. But I think I, you know, if you can hold your biologic for a little bit, things are well enough controlled. Uh, I would tend to hold whatever that is, uh, and then go on to have your vaccine. You're more likely to get a good response immunologically. So, if possible, yes. Okay. There's so a I question here about how long shingle shots are good for. I mean, right now, the data is five years, and if not longer. Um, I think actually it's going to be persistent. It's not like the old shingle shot, which actually wore, wore out four or five years. This one probably is going to be longstanding, but we need a few more years of data to be able to answer that question. Sorry, man, back to you. All right. Yeah, another question here is, uh, um, how long should you wait after COVID, uh, having COVID, should you wait for the RSV vaccination? That's a that's a that's an amazing question actually on many levels and and probably the concern I would have about having a vaccine soon after COVID is setting up the immune system again is is rechallenging the immune system getting it to activate again and so much of the issue with COVID is the immune response to the COVID that there's really no evidence for this one way or the other so I can't give an evidence answer but I would probably wait at least four weeks after COVID or after you've recovered from COVID. Okay, depending on the season and how concerned you are about the RSV, uh, because I don't want to reactivate any COVID inflammation. It also depends on how significant the COVID illness was. If it was a very mild COVID illness, fine, probably a week or two, it would be mm -hmm. fine. If you have a significant COVID illness or you still have some long COVID symptoms, you know, which we know has got to do with a combination of things related to inflammation, actually due to low serotonin levels, something they just actually discovered. So all those things are going to be factors. So I got to be careful about activating the immune system again in someone whose inflammation has not resolved. So it's not a specific answer because I don't have a specific answer, but sort of using first principles there, if your immune system is still sort of hyperactive because of COVID, I probably wouldn't give it another push. You know, it's like it's like it's like driving the extra mile on the tire that's a little low. You know, fill it up first and then drive. Okay. Is there an age limit for getting the vaccine though, the RSV vaccine? Let's say for people 80 and above. Um, no, uh, they had people over the age of 80 in the trial. There just wasn't enough on them to actually give you, for me to give you a statistical correlation there. But no, I don't think there's any reason not to. Obviously, it's got to do also with life expectancy and other status and things like that are going to make a decision. But you've got a healthy 80-year-old that wants to stay healthy and independent. Absolutely, I would I would consider it. And recommend, okay. not just consider, recommend it. Okay, there is also on, on, uh, some email exchanges here regarding how can we convince the government to act on it right away and be covered? And what can people do? Yeah, noise. No <laughs> noise from the respiratory community and the patients. Patient, uh, the, the government does not listen to physicians or uh, maybe a little bit to BC Lung. They listen to you more than they listen to me, perhaps, as you have advocacy groups. But they don't listen to, to, to individual clinicians at all. They don't listen to physician groups very well. They listen mm -hmm. to people because you're the ones who vote for them. So you need to actually, on a grassroots level, actually make this point, talk to them about it, talk about the financial hardships of a population that need it, and how important it is based on the data I showed you to actually prevent their illness. That's what's going to happen. It's already happening. Listen, I mean, each of the companies making them, they already have advocacy groups with the government. Everyone's trying to make this recommendation, as you know. You know, but you know, it's, it's you know, there's not a lot of money in our governments right now, so they're never looking to volunteer spending money. So I think we have to advocate for ourselves. Okay. All right, one last question, I think. Yeah. Uh, we uh, A patient is taking Offed for pulmonary fibrosis. Will there be any problem taking the RSV vaccination? No, no absolutely not. Okay, it's, it's uh, Offed is an antifibrotic agent for the lungs for, for IPF. Um, there'll be no problem with it. In fact, your group, you know, that population people and good luck with the OFEV and the IPF. I hope it slows things down for you. Um, but no, actually, you should have all the vaccines we just talked about prevent those acute exacerbations because unfortunately for IPF, exacerbations really lead to a rapid decline. So you want to prevent those as best possible. And as I said earlier, they're not all infectious exacerbations. But at least do what you can about preventing those. Okay. The, one, one, one last, last question. Yes, no problem. Will NASA be making a statement on RSV vaccine? Will NASA, N-A-C-I. Yeah. Yes. So, sorry, I, I didn't just didn't hear you. 
Yeah, so I mean, ASAP has done it now. Uh, NASI will eventually. NASI's a little slower than ASAP, as we've learned from our COVID experiences. Um, so they will, and I, I'm not part. I'm not on NASI, so I'm not party to tell you the actual answer. But I know that's something that's being worked on now. They had a few other things or priorities, like kind of like COVID. Uh, they had some some stuff that was keeping them pretty busy. Uh, so I don't know when that's going to come out, but hopefully it's going to come out in you know you know within this season. I'm hoping. Okay, Dr. Kaplan, one last question, really. This okay. is the last one. As many as you want, man. I'm here for you. So whatever you need. One of the questions here is that this patient is an adverent spreva, um, but he said he doesn't notice any change or any difference at all. Is this normal? This um, is maybe okay. a person uh, with COPD. Okay. Yeah, so there's a dozen different reasons that could occur. The first question is, is the diagnosis correct? So it has to, you obviously don't have to answer these questions. I'll give you a whole list of things and you can pick out which one may work for you. So have you had spirometry done that shows obstruction that does not reverse and so on, that's consistent with, with COPD. The second issue is, is, are you, are, is the medication being taken properly? So you're taking Advair and Spreva. They're two different devices. One's a dry powder. I mean, Spreva can be in a dry powder or it can be in Respimat, but there's opportunities for errors in the device. And if you don't get the medications, your lungs, it's not going to work. So please make sure that you get an educator, a pharmacist, your physician to make sure that the devices are being used properly. Uh, reason number three uh, may, uh, may be related to, the, to not just how you use the device, but simple things like holding your breath afterwards. So once you take once you take your medication either very quickly or forcefully with a dry powder and more slowly with a respimat, you want to make sure you hold your breath for at least the count of ten seconds, right? That's slowly one, two. You get the idea. Slowly, you want to keep it down your lungs so it works. Uh, and th the last thing I was thinking of is th being all those factors. It may be preferable to switch to a to a single uh, device and a single inhaler rather than having two separate inhalers. And I did show you the difference in that. But if you're having no benefit at all, you don't feel any difference at all. Um, it also depends on the severity of the lung function that you've got. So mild disease, well, first of all, why you want triple therapy if you have mild disease. Uh, but if no nothing at all, then there's something wrong in, in this story. I guess the other factor is sometimes people don't recognize the difference in just day-to-day, -day, uh, very quiet functioning, but you'll notice it on exercise. So if you if you stop the medication and then you try to you know run up the stairs or do something that's more exertional than normal and you compare that to being on the medication for a few days and see if there's a difference that might be where you actually see it but all of that will depend on the on the diagnosis and the lung function and, and so on so I hope that's giving you some ideas of where to go with that but it's often got to do with technique it's the most common diagnosis and technique and of course adherence uh, it's funny the medicine only works when you take it but I guess I, I'm gonna assume that you're actually taking it so. Right. Okay. Thank you very much for generously sharing your expertise and time with us today, Dr. Kaplan. And we look forward to having you again on this webinar. Right. It's really a truly a very inspiring and very informative session with you. Thank okay, you very my much. My pleasure. And uh, you guys all enjoy the better weather you have in BC than we have in Ontario. So we're getting free. My dog bowl outside was frozen today. So there you go. It gives you an idea of what it's like here. <laughs> all right. Have a great Thank day. Thank you very everybody. much. Thank right, you, bye -bye. everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.